Ms. McKay, thank you. Thank you all for joining us today. And Angela, uh, thank you for joining us as moderator. The floor is yours. Thank you and good morning, everyone. So I'm honored to be able to moderate the panel today on assessing and measuring the cybersecurity challenge. First, I thought I'd provide just some very brief remarks for context. Then I'll hand it over to our distinguished panelists for their remarks and presentations. And then as we have time, we'll have an opportunity for a little bit of QA from me. And then we'll have some closing remarks. So as context, much like the other speakers have noted, we really just cannot underestimate the remarkable transformative effects that have been brought about by information and communications technologies and services. It has spurred economic growth and development. It's enabled critical government functions to be done in new and different ways. It's connected civil society and also connected people with each other and with their governments in new and exciting ways. And while ICT is most often used for positive outcomes and purposes, it is also abused, misused for malicious purposes. And that is one of the reasons that cybersecurity is at the top of mind of world leaders. Whether we're talking with governments around the world or the business leaders around the world, this is a topic that is a top of mind. Just like all stakeholders, governments, enterprises, consumers, and civil society have contributed to the development of cyberspace, they all also have responsibilities in helping to secure it. That is why it's very important that we have a conversation on assessing and measuring the cybersecurity challenge and thinking about the respective roles and responsibilities of those various stakeholders in improving cybersecurity. Now, while I think assessing and measuring cybersecurity is very, very important, I also believe it's very difficult. And for many, many reasons. First of all, governments and enterprises have slightly different responsibilities that they are coming to that challenge from. Governments are thinking about their roles for protecting national security and public safety. Enterprises are thinking about their fiduciary responsibilities. What do they need to do to protect their critical functions and the data that they are holding associated with their businesses and or their customers? So as thinking about assessing risk, it's very important to think about all of the components. What are the various threats facing these organizations? What are the potential consequences of those? And what are the vulnerabilities that malicious actors can exploit to create these challenges? And at the same time, these organizations also have to think about how are they going to manage the risk? Most often, I hear conversations about what are we doing to mitigate the risk? But it's important to recognize there are at least three ways to think about managing risk. There's mitigating risk, transferring risk, for example, with the insurance market, and then also accepting risk, realizing that there is a certain amount of tolerance that an organization can accept. There has been considerable, as I noted, attention and overwhelming increase in the investment of cybersecurity of recent times. But it's important to think about measuring those because we're trying to understand, are those investments being effective? Are they directing resources appropriately towards priorities? Are they really helping to accept and manage down to an appropriate level? And in particular, as we think about the limited resources, you can't protect everything. So how are we prioritizing those investments? As you think about measurements, there's a couple of different ways to think about this. First of all, there are quantitative ways of measuring risk, qualitative ways of measuring risk, and relative ways of measuring risk. As I was in the taxi cab on the way over, I said, was noting, again, the difficulty in some of the measurement challenges. And I said, you know, I think oftentimes people are saying not just, you know, what is my pure state of cybersecurity, but what is it relative to others either in my industry or other governments? What is my relative risk and how does benchmarking apply? There are also different types of measurements, outputs 
In other words, these are oftentimes things like counting. What are we doing to improve cybersecurity? There's also outcome-focused metrics. So how effective are those activities? And then finally, also thinking about, again, that kind of relative risk environment. I'm gonna give an example right before I hand it over to the panelists here. Um, yesterday morning, I was talking with Melissa a little bit about penetration testing. Penetration testing is when organizations hire um, security researchers, also known sometimes as hackers, to attempt to get into their environments and reach a particular target. Penetration testing has long been used in the security industry, but for a long time it was focused just on can this hacker get into the environment? Unfortunately, because of the challenges in the ecosystem, penetration testers with the right resources can almost always get into an environment. And so while that was an important output metric, can you get in, it was not necessarily measuring the resiliency of these environments. So more recently, there has been a focus on moving penetration testing to look at other metrics. So not only how long does it take to get into an organization, but also how long does it take to get to the particular target. The point of access may not actually be the valuable target at the other side. Also, looking at how long does it take an organization to detect that particular act? And how long does it take them to remediate it? This is some of the kind of changes that we're seeing in the environment over time as we think about assessing and measuring cybersecurity risk. At this point, I'd like to turn it over to our distinguished panelists. They've already been introduced, so I will hand it over at this point, I think, to Melissa. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Angela. I, um, I want to thank uh, uh, DCM Highland uh, for your opening remarks, um, Dennis Blair and the Sasakawa USA Foundation who uh, enabled me to come over here to Japan, and of course, um, uh, Kyoto University and Dr. Murai. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about cyber readiness and, um, and some of the remarks that uh, you've heard this morning I'm going to breeze quite through. Um, this is a project that I've been working on for more than four years as a result of uh, my leading the cybersecurity strategy for the United States under two presidents and the lessons learned from that and the working with countries all around the world. And the internet, as you know, has become the backbone of family platforms, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. Um, it is the, uh, the business engine, and every business has been digitized, moving from email, the free flow of goods, services, data, capital across borders. It has become the critical service and enabled every critical service and citizen-facing service that uh, that we have in our society, and of course it is the backbone of the global economy. Over the last 20 years, over the last 20 years, uh -oh, we're missing a slide. Over the last 20 years, we have, uh, we have connected um, our industrial manufacturing, our, uh, our smart buildings, we've connected our energy grids to smart grids, we've connected our food supplies and our agriculture crops to um, internet protocol devices, we have enabled our financial systems, and we have enabled our healthcare systems. Every single critical service and infrastructure has been connected to the internet. And that economic opportunity cannot be ignored. We have a $3.6 trillion opportunity just this year alone for all of your products and services connecting these critical infrastructures and continuing to drive that digital economy. Over the course of the next four years, as we embrace the Internet of Things, there'll be an additional $19 trillion opportunity associated with that of connecting people, places, and things. And I'll talk more about the Internet of Things later this afternoon. Over the course of the next 10 years, as we modernize the industrial infrastructures and we connect them to the Internet and we bring Internet control, industrial control systems and the like connecting to the Internet, presents a 46% of the global economy and $32 trillion. And as we connect more and more of our citizens to the internet, and we still have more than half of the population to connect to the internet, that should present GDP growth and opportunity for our countries. 
And we expect that to continue over the course of the next few years. We have deep consumer penetration, as been discussed, but we have still more to do to connect for the free flow of goods, services, data, and capital across borders, as was discussed by the trade agreements and the things that we're pushing as countries to enable that free flow of goods, data, services, and capital. In the security and safety and warfare, we have more to connect and we have an education even more because we have not digitized our campuses. We have not brought external learning capabilities to our students. And we have even more to go for healthcare and telemedicine. Over the course of the next few years, the centerpiece becomes the digital agenda and the digital growth opportunity. And Prime Minister Abe has talked about that, that everything will connect to the internet and that cybersecurity has to be an indispensable foundation or we will not realize that growth opportunity. And that economic opportunity is at risk. It's at risk because there are a number of countries that are facilitating the fraud there are a number of, and crime, and disruption of service, and destruction of property. And it's time that we start measuring those losses. The Netherlands decided to start, and she was the first country to measure it. And in that year, she measured that they were losing 2% of their GDP, or 10 billion euro, just to e-crime, e-fraud, and intellectual property theft. Uh, we also measured in the United States that we were losing 1% of our GDP to intellectual property theft alone. Germany, 1.5% of her GDP. And India and Nigeria and Russia are all emerging to starting to measure their losses. If I were to bet, I would say that every single country, and especially the G20 countries, are all losing at least 1% of their GDP. And that cyber insecurity, the flaws, the vulnerabilities, the poorly engineered products in the market that is enabling crime and fraud and intellectual property theft and business disruption and business destruction is a tax on growth. And we must address it. And it's going to, and it is top of mind of many leaders around the world, as Angela said, and as, uh, DCM Highland said, when I worked for President Obama, he gave a speech on May 29, 2009, and said that cybersecurity is the most important economic and national security challenge facing our country. And he's been consistently speaking about that. We see President Xi talking about that it is two wings of the same bird and that we have to embrace the innovation agenda but ensure that it's secure and resilient along the way. And President Xi and China's digital agenda is probably the most sophisticated digital agenda around the world. President Merkel or Chancellor Merkel has talked about that we, the technology is ahead of us and we must address the privacy and security challenges facing our countries. And President Putin talks about that I don't want this technology to be in the hands of these uh, commercial entities, that governments must govern this space, not commercial enterprises. And then finally, President Abe, or Prime Minister Abe has talked about this as core to the growth strategy of Japan. As I said, more than 100 countries are shaping the future of this, and the activities um, are increasing uh, every day. So are we cyber ready? We have to start to look at readiness along two sets of metrics. Our countries are looking at this from a digital agenda for the economic prosperity, the productivity, the efficiency, and the GDP growth. Those digital agendas are driving our agendas for the future. And then in the same breath, and usually a different part of our government, not aligned to the overall strategy, we talk about national security, intellectual property protection and data protection, defense of our homeland, and in many countries, regime stability. And it's time we start to align these metrics, which is why I developed the Cyber Readiness Index. Um, and it takes into account more than 70 different variables along uh, seven different areas of national security and incident response and your law enforcement capacity and information sharing and so on to actually drive the readiness of countries so that you do align the economic agenda with the national security agenda. And right now they're misaligned in almost every country around the world.
I'm in the process of assessing 125 countries, and it has been translated into the UN languages in order to allow for more wide use and adoption across countries. Those seven essential elements are measured against four specific criteria. It's not enough just to have a policy or a statement of intent. You must organize for that. You must resource personnel and money for it, and you must implement it. We're in very different stages of these particular areas of evaluation per country. And then I assess based on you're either fully operational because you have all four components, you're partially operational because maybe you only have some of it, or there's insufficient evidence because you don't have any of it, or it's so highly classified nobody knows about it. So within those seven particular areas of the framework, we have the national strategy. And it's not enough to just have a national strategy, but you have to have a competent authority, the person or the entity that is responsible and accountable for implementing that strategy. It must be based on GDP growth and losses as a balance sheet like we would run our corporations. And right now we're not measuring those losses, so how can we actually identify what are the strengths and opportunities and positive outcomes of those strategies? And then finally, on that particular area, you must identify the critical services and industries upon which you're dependent upon executing that strategy, because at the end of the day, the government does not build, it does not operate, and it will never restore those critical services and infrastructures upon which all of our nations depend. Second, we must have an incident response capability, a CERT, some type of function that can help support that free flow of information during, and that threat information during a time of crisis. Third, we must clean up our infrastructures. We have botnets that, are, that have infected many of our infrastructures and causing crime, of which my colleague uh, Yuri Ito will talk about in her measurement, because her measurements complement the measurements in my particular index. Hers are operational, and mine are more strategic. And, the, and we also look at, are you a member of the Cyber Crime Convention or the Shanghai Cooperation Organization to uh, facilitate the, uh, this, uh, uh, defense and the prosecution of criminal activity across borders because many of the crimes are being conducted in my country or your country against me or against you through those infected infrastructures. We need to have information sharing regimes. Our governments have exquisite information that needs to be shared with industry and our industry has exquisite information that needs to be shared with government and we're not sharing information as readily as we could and should in order for to have a more resilient outcomes of our nations and more cybersecurity. We need to have a better research and development agenda that actually uses that investment from industry or the investment from a government in order to drive what is the future architecture that we want and need for the Internet of Things. We need to embrace that diplomacy and trade needs to balance the economics and the national security. We shouldn't be negotiating trade agreements that have data localization because that actually does prohibit the free flow of goods and services across uh, borders, and we shouldn't be negotiating in trade agreements as arms control, where we're actually prohibiting some of our products that can make us more secure and resilient from going into the marketplace. Our negotiators need to be more sophisticated and not look at it through a single lens. And then finally, our nations are under attack, and we're seeing more and more of our critical infrastructures disrupted and destroyed, and it's important that each of our nations have the ability to defend themselves. As I said, I'm uh, looking at this across 125 countries, and they were chosen based on who's the most connected and who's the most economically strong, because those are the countries that have the most to lose. And as I approached the G7, we did a little bit of a quick cursory analysis of the G7 countries, all of which have strategies, some of which have strong GDP, and some of which do not, and none of which are cyber ready because they don't have all of the capabilities needed. And there are 70 submetrics behind each of these particular areas. But it's important to note that even the G7, the most wealthy and the most connected countries around the world, are not cyber ready. Why is that? Because perhaps they haven't thought about the problem strategically. Where is the government and the nation going from the digital economy? And have we brought the security agenda in balance with that? 
and have we an implementation plan that we're going to measure and hold accountable and ensure that it's resourced efficiently to measure and minimize our risks going forward? And then are we going to manage it like we would a portfolio and a business? And we're not as governments. And so that requires that we commit limited resources and we get strong executive bandwidth and money and political capital and recognize that we don't have a lot of time to build resilience back into our, gen into our countries. We've actually made ourselves less resilient over the last 20 years and it's going to take us likely another 20 years to build the resilience back in. We need to acknowledge that it is outcomes depend on multi-stakeholders because the government can't do it alone and the government must develop a, a, a very sophisticated strategy of market levers that include incentives, not just regulatory and penalty-based mechanisms. And embrace the technology, we can't be afraid of it, but we need to create the un and ensure that we're not creating more exposure as we embrace the technology of the Internet of Things, which is what we are currently doing globally. And so when you start to look at the current trends, our outpacing, the threat is outpacing our defenses. Our lack of a resilience has emerged as a significant national security agenda issue among all of our countries. And that lack of network resilience, that lack and the increased and vast threat landscape that is imposing crime and fraud and intellectual property theft and disruption of our core businesses and destruction of our key property is an tax on growth and is jeopardizing our economic opportunity. And only until we measure both the economic benefits as well as the security and lack of security uh, uh, deficiencies will we start to bring cyber readiness into the fold. Because today no nation is cyber ready. We have to proactively shape our future and drive modernization and the adoption of that technology with security at its core. Thank you very much. Good morning. I have to lower it down a little bit for my size. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Yuri Ito. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you all today. Um, I'm an executive director of the Cyber Green Institute, which is an um, international nonprofit organization conducting a focused activities to improving the cyber technical ecosystem's health. Um, through metrics-based measurement and mitigation support. Um, I am also a director of the Global Coordination of the JPSAT. Um, what I'd like to talk today is, you know, first of all, I have to emphasize, you know, repeating the whole, you know, great previous speakers, um, Melissa, Angela, and all the distinguished um, speakers um, mention about this. The online world serves as a critical portal um, to a worldwide market, government operation, critical infrastructure, and social dialogue. Um, the internet is simply too critical and too big to be failed. Um, as this is the um, evidence to see today in you know, this you know, beautiful weather, but there's so many thinkers and leaders um, gather in this room and discuss about this. Um, we are all at the risk of being attacked from internet systems and infrastructure controlled by the malicious actors. Cybersecurity is one of the most invested um, area of most of the critical industry and the government at the advanced, um, you know, developed countries. Yet we're still seeing the big risks at the horizon, and the problem is we're all have to build the castle and then to build the walls to protect us on the untreated swamp water. Even though you secure up your own, you know, internal own organizations and keep up your hygiene, keep up your cyber hygiene in your organization, you still have to connect 
with the devices and service of your customers, your users, service providers, business peers, business partners globally. And those systems and devices are infected. Poor hygiene can be the attack infrastructure directly against you. So you cannot just block them. Um, you cannot just you know, simply secure up your um, own organization. Um, we really must improve the health of the ecosystem and mitigate the system systemic risks globally. Um, but the um, problem is we do not have a good understanding of the state of the health and risks and how to measure um, them globally. Um, worldwide cyber health varies by region, um, countries, enterprise. Some are doing good, um, but they are, some are not good. There are many vulnerable and compromised computers and network devices out there. However, we don't know how much risk we are exposed to, either globally, by country, or by service provider. Um, Cybergreen is a global community of experts um, trying to improve this red circle, the healthness of the cyber ecosystem by metrics-based measurement and mitigation support. Um, so what is the um, poor um, cyber technical ecosystem health? There are a large number of infected devices and vulnerable nodes um, in the global internet ecosystem, posing the risks to us all. Um, we need to clean up those infected machines, mitigating the systemic level of risk condition out there. And there are two challenges we have to um, foster these global mitigation activities, which is the first one. I'm going to go to this one first. Um, the first one. Um, the lack of understanding um, of the um, root cause analysis and addressing the systemic risks. So I'd like to use the public healthcare analogy here. In the public healthcare industry, the you know, community, um, when to, to respond to the risks of malaria, the public health organizations globally measuring the patients, um, you know, monitoring the number of the incidents, number of the patient's counts and all that. 